see my wife this morning. She's in Abuja doing the Lord's work. <laughs> Amen. All right. Part four of uh, Kingdom Wealth. I, I trust that you've been blessed. And um, I, I pray that these words indeed stay with us in Jesus' name and produces for us in the name of Jesus. And I think it's a series that uh, you really want to glean and, and listen to every part of it so that you have the complete completeness of what the Lord is revealing to us or speaking or emphasizing to us in this time. Amen. Um, so we have spent the last three weeks and we'll still do a little bit of that this morning, sort of laying the foundation um, and visiting again some of the things that are critical to, to wealth creation as far as the kingdom is concerned, and to help us to understand that as believers, indeed, God is not opposed to us coming into wealth or material gain in life. Um, he's interested in us coming into wealth, coming into influence, and he is a stakeholder as well in that journey. There is, um, there is a thirst for every, let me say, every normal human being whose, uh, uh, whose heart has not been uh, reconditioned, uh, who has not been brainwashed. And it would take a lot to, to brainwash a man from being aspirational in life. It would take a lot to expunge that desire for more. Amen. Everything about the journey of man is often centered around something. You, you, are, you are seeking for something, you are seeking for more. And one of those things that you're seeking for, oftentimes, is a dimension of financial freedom. Amen. Financial freedom means you come into a state where you don't have to work for money. Amen. Money is working for you. Financial freedom enables you, indeed, to pursue a lot of meaningful projects and things in life. Um, and it's a disposition of mind that is also kingdom-oriented. Amen. And by default, it is encouraged. I think it's said somewhere in Proverbs that you should not labor to be rich or do not labor for money. Amen. Uh, that is something that is a little difficult to accept or to receive or to incorporate as a natural man. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because some of you are going to wake up tomorrow morning and the only reason you are going to get up and go to work is because you must make money. Am I right or right? Am I right or correct? <laughs> Praise God forevermore. And it's fine, but um, the desire of God is to give you something more meaningful that wealth, in terms of financial wealth now, is only a byproduct, something that is more meaningful, something that is stronger, something that is more powerful, something that is more kingdom-centered around your being, around your pursuits, around the things that you're passionate about. You know, you go through a system, particularly here in Nigeria, um, where you write your jamb and you apply for something, but they give you something else, have you? You know, it's what they gave me. You know, the nation con con contrives to define your destiny, quote unquote. <laughs> you want to read medicine? It's biochemistry, take. 
That's what we are giving you. Amen. How many of you did what they gave you, not what you wanted? Let me say, hand of... <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. There comes a time in life you must locate what God's assignment for you is. Praise God. And take control over the outcomes and do what you intend to do by the grace of God and not what life is handing to you. Are you following what I'm saying? Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, so we'll get, as the Spirit leads, into some, what I call tacticals. I've taught some of them before, and don't expect that we'll really get there this morning. I don't think so. Amen. Hallelujah. You want to be financially free? Amen. Seek you first. And how many of you really believe that scripture? You sure? Praise God. You know, you never really know until the word of God really tries you, right? Hmm? Seeks to move you out of your comfort zone so that you can pursue kingdom. But there's a lot of concern about what happens if I move out of this comfort zone. Amen. Okay, let's get into... Maybe we'll come back and dance around that a little bit. Praise God. So last week, we began to look at a number of things. Um, and we said that, uh, indeed, one of the things which don't begins to tell us is that there are certain things that are more valuable than money. And the fact that, you know, wisdom helps you to see treasure in other things and helps you to see the futility of being focused on just chasing after money, just chasing after mammon, just chasing to be rich, just chasing to be wealthy, and all of that. Um, and the truth is, once the, the Word of God is able to begin to shift your eyes from there, uh, wisdom begins to indeed show you things that are more precious than gold and silver. We mentioned the fact that relationships are key and that you need to invest in them. And you need to understand something about relationships Relationships indeed talks to the gifts of men, all right? The fact that you are blessed with gifts of men within your sphere of influence. There are people around you. And it takes the manifestation of the Spirit. There are dimensions of the manifestation of the Spirit. It takes the manifestation of the Spirit for you to recognize some relationships that are indeed relationships of destiny. Praise God. Relationships that you must nurture. Relationships that you can't afford to discard. Are you following what I'm saying this morning? Because it may not be apparent today. You cannot pre-conclude on the destiny of a man by just assessing him in his today. And conclude that there is nothing he can add to you. Or there is nothing... There is... There is no reason for you to cultivate that relationship because you can't see an immediate gain from that relationship. Hallelujah. Pay attention to the manifestation of the Spirit or the move of the Spirit that propels you to form relationships or form bonds or cords, you know, with people. Are you following what I'm saying? Because they can be useful for you years down the line. I cited a few examples. Praise God. And it is also wisdom for you to understand, and listen to me very carefully, that you ensure that as much as it relies on you, you remain at peace with all men. You are not only um, ensuring that you are not disrupting relationships, 
that are cordial and that are beneficial or everything is going well, praise God, watch out for people that despitefully use you, people that may have cheated you, people that may have wronged you in one way or the other. Are you following what I'm saying? You do not repay evil for evil. You see, the wisdom of Christ that spoke in that direction about the fact that you should not retaliate evil for evil, that if someone slaps you on the left cheek, and I've interpreted that we had some debates around that, have we? Praise God. I won't go there this morning. That you turn the left. Praise God. Amen. It's not just about you being a two goody shoes person. Are you following that you, you are just a good Christian? It's, it's beyond, let me just be a good Christian. It is strategic to your life and to your destiny. Praise God. There is, there is wisdom in it. So the, the employer that, that owed you salary, the next thing you, you want to do or you shouldn't do is, for example, go on social media and then broadcast with an intent to repay evil for evil. Are you following what I'm saying? You know, there's someone I refuse to hire because of that. I don't care, you know, talented and all. Uh, no. Amen. <laughs> and not because there is any intent to cheat, but there's just something that is not consistent with the logic of Christ. Praise God. Does this sound strange to you? It's a radical shift because Jesus himself started by saying, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye. You understand? This is the norm. This is what's acceptable. But it came with a different kind of wisdom and letting us understand that, look, as much as it relies on you, retain peace with all men. Amen. People who have been unkind to you. Amen? People who have been unkind to you in one way or the other, ensure that you remain at peace with them. Rejoice with them even when they rejoice. Are you following what I'm saying? When things are working out for them, do not wish them evil in your heart. Do not say in your heart, why do people like this prosper? Amen. Dip your hand in your pocket, package something, and say, take, congratulations. That's the admonition of Christ. It's, it's beyond just being a good Christian. That's why he said, take heed to yourself. If your brother offends you, forgive him. Are you following? He said, take heed to yourself. It is for your own sake that you should do what? Extend forgiveness. Do not disrupt your own journey and your own destiny by staying in animosity with people. Praise God. Men are important. Men are critical. Men are doors. Relationships are key. Invest in them. Something I wrote here is that, and I've seen that manifest, you know, over and over. Uh, do not belittle people, all right? Praise God. Do not belittle people. Do not weigh the quality of your contribution by your natural assessment of people. Are you following what I'm saying? You know, there's somewhere in Proverbs. And he talked about the futility of you deliberately giving, you know, favor to people who are wealthy or to the rich because you are trying to curry their favor. Amen. Do not zero in people and analyze their current circumstance and by virtue of that, decide the measure of the quality of what you will 
deliver into their life. It can even be in the form of service, for example. Amen. Do not commonize people. Are you following what I'm saying? Do not commonize people. It may be someone you're familiar with, your brother, your sister, someone within your, your neighborhood. Praise God. Tell anybody, listen to what pastor is saying this morning. No? And then they come to subscribe to a service you are offering or something that you're doing. And then you just decide, I'm going to do it, quote and unquote, anyhow. Or I won't put in my best. Because, after all, now PDA. Praise God. So, so imagine, for instance, PDA comes and subscribes and says, okay, I need some consulting service from me. And I decide, okay, it's PDA. Now, we, we, you understand? Let me just, you know, I will delay the project. I will do it anyhow. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Amen. Put your best foot forward all the time because you never know. Have you been disappointed before by someone taking you for granted? Anybody here? That's why Jesus said, the way you want to be treated, also treat others that way. Glory to God forevermore. Don't take people for granted. You never know what doors can open from there. Look at A.Y.'s wedding yesterday. Wonderful. Put your hands together for Asha. <laughs> Amen. You know, just <laughs> praise God. It's a busy A.Y. You can see how she was ensuring everything worked out well. Bam, 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 bam. Amen. You are sowing seeds. You don't know what can come out of those events, those random requests that could happen. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. You want story? I know I said a lot of story last week. Let me restrain. I'm telling, but I'm, I'm telling you something really powerful. Praise God. Really, really powerful. Don't despise people. Don't what? Despise people. You know. Uh, because of time, let me not tell that story. Praise God. Uh -uh. Some other time. Let's go on. Maybe to come again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You know, you remember the story of Joseph? And, and you know, years ago when we, when we looked into that story and, you know, saw very clearly how his relationship with the butler and the baker and essentially how the dream of the butler and the baker together was essentially the other side of the same coin with the dream that Pharaoh would have. And how we saw scripturally how his interactions with the bottle and the baker uh, meant that there was still something missing somewhere with respect to his journey. And when the word of God fully tried him, you know, then Pharaoh dreamt. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Don't take people for granted. Praise God. Amen. Solve their problems. Even when their destiny looks like they are doomed. Praise God. Just look at you. You are doomed. You, you are going back to the palace. Remember me. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. 
Go the extra mile. Hallelujah. Proverbs 22, um, 1 and 2, we, we looked at two things. Uh, we talked about a great name also being something to be more desired. And the other thing is favor. There is one person or character in scriptures, you know, you see it in the life of Joseph, the fact that he was highly favored, all right? He was, he was favored of Potiphar. There, there was just something about him that brought him favor before men. Another person you would see as well, uh, and just to highlight, you go read the story of Esther. I'm just still painting. We'll get into the word this morning. Amen. You get into the story of Esther, and you find that favor was also at work with her. Not just with the king, even before meeting with the king, even the person who was taking care of, you know, the, the, the women, the maids. You know, the Bible said he, she found favor with him and he, he dispensed things that she needed quickly. There was something about her that caused him to favor her. And it was the combination of these favors that also assisted her before the king. Amen. There is something about favor. There is something about you coming into things, coming into the goodwill of people without any apparent reason. Amen. That people just like you. There is a mystery of likability. Just being liked. Amen. And watch out for people who just like you. Don't run away from people who like you, who take interest in you. Some of you are working in a place and there's just someone there who just takes interest in you. For no apparent reason, they just want to see you succeed. You've not done anything for them. You've not assisted them in any way, but they just like you. It is strategic in the equation of destiny. Are you following what I'm saying this morning? When you see people that just like you, know that there is a, there is a bank of favor locked up for you with a person. And many a times, particularly when you can't find any apparent reason why this person just has interest in you. Just understand that this is God at work. Because there is nothing, even if you ask, I say, so, so why, why is it that you just take special interest in me? The person himself may not know why. May not have any reason why. Be careful how you manage such relationships. Such relationships are gifts indeed. You would continue to feel a sense of indebtedness as you nurture those relationships. Amen. Indebtedness that you know that in a lifetime, many a times you, you can't even pay back. Are you following what I'm saying this morning? Amen. Because by default, and as you move through life, it is possible that you, you just really don't pay attention to those occurrences in the dynamics of your relationship with men. Amen. You just let them sleep. You just let them go. You don't, you, don't, you don't invest in them. Praise God. Some of you need to think back about people that really liked you. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. Because listen, apart from your mother and your father, and maybe your siblings, maybe, praise God, not everybody is going to like you. 
And I'm using the word like because we are a bit more familiar with it, right? But not everybody would seek your favor. In fact, the likelihood is more people will really not send you in life. So the people that really send you, <laughs> praise God, <laughs> you want to nurture those relationships. Hallelujah. Somebody say, be likable. And you can cultivate it. You know, don't be the type of person that walks into a room and, you know, there's negative energy all the time. You just move around with negative energy. Praise God. Be a positive guy. Be a positive person. Amen. Exude positivity. Praise God forevermore. Amen. Very key. Take interest in people. Take interest in people. Amen. Now let's go into something this morning. And um, the first thing that comes to mind when we start looking at strategic imperatives to moving in a direction of influence and wealth. Something that we cannot discard. Something that has to be at the center. And if I would say of a kingdom-oriented journey to influence where every other thing is being added onto you is the concept of vision. And I know that this is something that I've over time emphasized, but there's no way to begin to go really into the tactical, practical things without establishing this concept of vision. Somebody say vision. There are people who embrace visions. One way or the other, they have a dimension of thought that pictures a future that they desire. Amen. As believers, we must understand that there are thoughts that God is thinking towards us to hand to us a future. And so our journey must be anchored on the vision that God is placing before us. And I know we've said this when we started talking about meditation on the Word of God. We are going back there now and looking at it from a strategic point of view. Praise God. Because your vision creates a limitation or an invisible limitation around the possibilities that you will encounter in life. Your vision is a wall, is an invisible wall of constraint that constrains what is possible to you in life. How you see is critical and God wants to hand you a vision so that you can see the glory that you had before you came into this world. Jesus, in praying, said to God, he said, give back to me the glory I had with you. Are you following what I'm saying? There is a glory. I think it's Wole Aroli that made this thing popular. He said there is, how does he put it? Ogo. One gigabyte, 10 gig, you know, 50 gig, whatever. Praise God. Some of you are watching, you are looking at me as if you don't know. Holy, really. Praise God. <laughs> Somebody say glory. Amen. <laughs> God wants to give you a vision of the glory that is ahead of you. And it is in pursuit of that that you are in pursuit of the kingdom where you have all the things handed 
unto you. It's in the pursuit of that that you discipline yourself by the Holy Spirit to walk in a path of righteousness. Vision is constraining. Vision means that you can't do everything, anything. Vision means that there is a path that is narrow. It is narrow not because uh, it is difficult. It is narrow because it is constraining. Praise God. Vision hands you a narrow path. It's called focus. It's called the path of life. Amen. It's not a broad path where you can do any and everything. Are you following what I'm saying this morning? Somebody say path of life. Praise God. Um, uh, let me not delve into, into other things. Praise God. What you must understand is that the Father indeed has a desire for each and every one of us you are not an incident. You are beyond just the BVN number. Are you following what I'm saying? You need to understand that he's deliberate about you. He knows you intimately. You must believe and understand that not a strand of the hair on your head falls without his knowledge. You must believe and understand that you are ever inscribed before him. You must understand that he knows you intimately and is interested in your journey. You must understand that he has not left you fatherless without a vision in life. And let me say this, it is okay and don't feel awkward. It's okay that, you know, you take hold and you take advantage of opportunities that show up around you. Are you following? Amen. You acquire this skill, acquire that skill, do this, do that. It's all well and good. Praise God forevermore. Amen. There is wisdom in whatever your hand finds to do. Do it well. Do not withhold your hand during the day in the evening. Do not fail to gather. Are you following what I'm saying? There's wisdom in that. But there comes a time as well. And this is, if you don't have it yet, it's something you need to go to God with in the place of prayer. And search deep within your heart. Because there comes a time that all these things need to begin to aggregate themselves and put you on a path that is definite. Glory to God forevermore. Vision gives you a definite path in life. You know, when you go into organizations and in the world of, you know, business advisory, you, you try to draw up a strategy for an organization, they, they talk about strategic intent. What are your strategic intent? What's your vision? What's your mission? Praise God. Some of you work in places where they've put those things on the wall, Abby. Vision statement. Mission statement. You know, the tragedy sometimes is that consultants have come and drafted something that is at variance with what is in the heart of the, the, the visionaire. And sometimes the visionaire is because he really doesn't have any vision as, as well. He's just hustling. Praise God. He's just, let us just make this money. Let's just make this money. 
Thank you, consultant. Yes, we now have a vision and a mission on the wall. Let's, let's do the packaging. But his heart is not there. Praise God. <laughs> Why are you all laughing? <laughs> Praise God. But when you see some organizations that pay keen attention where it is something that comes from the heart and they're in pursuit of it, you see a different kind of organization. You see a different kind of growth. You see a different kind of loyalty. Are you following what I'm saying this morning? Amen. It is indeed strategic. It's, it's, it's the anchor that holds everything together. A strategy, there's something called trade-offs. Trade-offs means that you can't do everything. So will this be good for us to do? No, I won't do it. Amen. Praise God. I was looking at a client's journey recently, you're on this path and suddenly you update your application. You say, no, 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 we've updated it. Said, okay, let me go and see what you've updated. And I saw division. Like, it was just chaos. Praise God. And I'm like, the, the market that you sought to attract in the first place, they will come there and not see what attracted them in the first place because you are now doing other things. Praise God. There's something about staying power and staying there. Praise God forevermore. Amen. Let me just cite this example. You know, I was listening to this lady, um, one of the co-founders of Piggy Vest, right? You know Piggy Vest? And I think one of the questions was somewhere around, why are you not doing other things like that? So many other things you can't do. I said, well, what we are trying to do is help people save, right? We help you save and manage your wealth, savings. Have you ever wondered why you can't buy airtime there? Buy airtime, you know, subscribe to DSTV. Praise God. Am I being practical now? Is that, that's not why we exist. We are not trying to help you and assist your spending. So if they are just looking for how to make money, we can make money from airtime. Oh yeah, airtime. Oh yeah, this one. Oh yeah. Praise God. Amen. It's called trade-offs. You can do it, but you won't do it. Hallelujah. Let's open our Bibles. Habakkuk chapter 2. For some reason, this TV is off. Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, a very popular scripture, amen. Talking a lot this morning. It says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and we'll watch to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. One of the first things that vision does is that it would reprove you. When, when vision dawns, I remember what we said that a wise person 
would rejoice when he is rebuked. Amen. And accepting that rebuke, sending a signal that there is a heart of humility here ready to receive instructions of wisdom. Hallelujah. The prophet here, from his basic experience with God, understands that one of the first things that begins to happen is that there is reproving. There is cost correction that will begin to happen. When certain thoughts arise in the heart that are exhibiting doubts and are questioning, questions of destiny, praise God. When the word of God begins to come, one of the things it begins to do to you is to reprove. Part of that reproof is to frame, is to put boundaries and a frame around your thinking. Putting boundaries and a frame around your possibilities. It is not constraining them. It is showing you, and that is something I do want to get into, praise God. Because you need to have an understanding that when we speak to the fact that there is a constraining of love. Um, you don't have the mentality that you are being tied or you are in bondage. You are actually being released into um, a sphere where you can experience liberty and possibilities that are boundless. Hallelujah. In other words, there are some things that would not be possible to you if you approach life with a broad-minded, uh, I do not want to say mindedness, praise God, with broad-mindedness, hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I left that mindedness, but here it appears again. Amen. You are not approaching life going on a broad path. There are things that would not be possible unto you when you are on a broad path. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. Hallelujah. So don't think about a narrow path with respect to a constraint of possibilities. It's actually opening up possibilities is broadening and expanding the things that can happen for you. But there is a path where those possibilities are unlocked. Praise God. It's a path of liberty. Praise God. <laughs> it sounds like it is contrasting, right? But it is not. Hallelujah. Amen. So it begins to correct you. It begins to reprove you. Hallelujah. So one of the things you must be able to embrace on this journey is to accept criticism. Amen. Accept. Be humble enough to accept that, okay, it's not being done correctly. You know, when Moses sat judging the people of Israel, his uncle came and said, oh boy, you're going to die on this journey. And handed him wisdom. Wisdom to delegate and ensure that he's more effective as a leader. Praise God. He didn't go on and say, well, it's me that God called. Amen? It's me that God handed this over to. And any, you know, some people can't even just take any form of criticism. You know, there are leaders that are so insecure that if a member of staff says, eh, we can do this better, they just feel like, do you mean I'm not thinking? They, they feel as if it makes them less smart. 
<laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Accept criticism. Because, listen, some of the ways God's word and his instructions will come, it's not by hearing one loud voice somewhere. Amen. The course correction that may come may just be in casual conversation with someone. Hallelujah. Some of those casual conversations, as we've said oftentimes, you must understand that some of them are very spiritual in nature. God can speak through a donkey to restrain you from foolishness. Are you following? Some things may just be casual, happening around you, but pay keen attention. Amen. You must be ready for rebuke. It helps you to sharpen your vision. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He said, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that reads it. The first person that needs to run is you. <laughs> Praise God. And let me say this. I'm not just speaking to entrepreneurs. And when I say entrepreneurs, you know, people who are starting out something on their own or kicking off a business venture. This applies to every single person. Entrepreneurs or entrepreneurship is not only limited to people who are starting their own thing. Entrepreneurship simply means that you are taking ownership and responsibility. And this is something we'll talk about. We will not get there today. Hallelujah. You're taking what? Ownership and responsibility. Organizations are looking for people who are entrepreneurial. It doesn't mean that people who are going to start their own thing. But people who are ready to drive a vision. Praise God. So you're a product manager. You have your own team. What is your vision? Praise God. Whatever has been committed into your hands to do, whatever post that you are manning within an organization, you have to be visionary about it. Hallelujah. Don't be that person that only moves when they are told to move. Are you following what I'm saying? Glory to God. Listen to me. You know, Bralalade was saying something, and this was something I mentioned to guys that I was having meetings with on Thursdays at some point. And he was saying something on Thursday, very powerful. And that's the fact that the things that are easy to do, um, you find that there is less value there. They are less valued. If it's easy to do, praise God, something that Plenty of people can do. You don't find those things attracting significant value. So value gravitates towards people who have learned to do difficult things. Beyond difficult things, let me categorically say that people who have learned to do smart things are you following what I'm saying? People who have learned to be smart with how they do what they do. People who add that little bit of extra to what they are doing. Amen. Because that little bit of extra that you're adding, praise God, is separating you from the multitude. It's distinguishing you from the multitude. Praise God. So consistently you are thinking, how can I do it better? How can I add value to this job or to this work or to this thing that has been handed over to me? How can I do it better? So there is always a striving to add value. Praise God. Amen. 
Be entrepreneurial. Be visionary. Own it. Amen. Own it. I was speaking to someone recently about, I won't mention his name because it's quite, it's quite well known, but his career took a different turn just based on this principle. Completely different turn. He was in this organization, very well-known organization, but I won't, I won't mention the name, oil and gas, one of the major oil and gas companies. And one of the MDs resigned, you know, and moved on. And he was just put there to FIDIHE. You know what FIDIHE means? Eh? Interim national government. Just hold forth. We have not given you the title or anything, but just manage this ship until we find the right person to come and take and occupy this role. So all he had to do, his job description, was just maintain status quo. That's all. Maintain what? Status quo. But he refused to maintain status quo. Visionary. So while they were, <laughs> while they were shopping for a new CEO, are you following? That particular division of the business, revenue was climbing. Are you following what I'm saying? He also said, just maintain. This guy was accelerating growth, coming up with initiatives and doing that. And the GMD stood on, I said, wait a minute. For Christ's sake, why are, we, why are we shopping for an empty? Look at this guy. Look at the performance. <laughs> Praise God. And as I took the position, very young age. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's read somewhere quickly. Uh, Proverbs. Because this brings... Proverbs... Uh, whoa. Proverbs 10, I believe. Proverbs 10, verse 5. Proverbs 10, verse 5 is pretty much speaking to opportunities, right? It says, He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in what? Harvest is a son that causeth shame. Sleeping in harvest means that there is opportunity and you are not taking hold of that opportunity. Amen. You are sleeping on the bicycle, as they say. Hallelujah. Destiny is beckoning, but you are asleep. You are not awake. You are not alive to what is happening. Hallelujah. Amen. We've digressed. Let me try to put this together and, and just close out. Hallelujah. So he's saying that you should write the vision. And I digress into it's not just for entrepreneurs. Praise God. So be visionary. Write the vision. Articulate it. Amen. Put it down. So that the people that read may what? Run with it. There was something that came into my heart as we prayed yesterday night. And I'm seeing that word or that action word run. Run. Praise God. What vision does is to set you in motion. And it is to cause you to run. Run implies urgency. Run implies speed. Praise God. Amen. And like I was saying when we were praying yesterday, or well, this morning, 
what vision does is to give you light. Praise God. It gives you a path. It paints a picture before you. It, it, it infects your imagination to see a future that is grand. Hallelujah. You know, when you look at a city that moved from being a, a complete desert, and in the course of 10 years, it looks like a futuristic city, a center of attraction. It didn't just happen by default. What you are seeing in manifestation is the imagination of a man coming into life. So I've always said something. When people say that, oh, Nigeria, it will take 50 years for us to catch up, I, I said no. So you may say, but we've been on that journey how many years now? Praise God. May God grant us visionary leaders. Within a space of 10 years, it, how long did it take for China as well? So why are they lying to us here that it's going to take you 50 years? Amen. There is something about vision that compels speed. Hallelujah. That compels a sense of urgency. Because, you see, it sets you in motion. You've seen the future and you can't wait to get there. So it propels you. Hallelujah. Once you see light, understand that it's propelling you to speed up. Praise God. Amen. And, and, and the, the example that was coming to my mind is something that happened. I was driving home with Tokwe, and I'm sure she noticed that was on Thursday. There was no street light, you know, on the way home from church. I know there are massive portals around this lake here. But if, if you jump into any one of them by speed in the night, it can be catastrophic for you. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. And my own headlamps are not those bum bum. You know those headlamps that can blind. So I was moving at snail speed. I was just moving. Maybe I was driving at 20, 30 kilometers. Just moving. So see the portal, just quickly avoid it. Praise God. We are talking about, <laughs> if anything happens at that time of the night, there's, there's, nobody, <laughs> there's nobody to come to your rescue. Hallelujah. Amen. And I noticed something. Each time another car comes that has great light, I pick up speed. Praise God. So I quickly accelerate to use that extra light to aid my journey. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's really what vision does. It gives you light. Hallelujah. It gives you light. So once you see, it sets you in motion. Let's go back to Habakkuk. Not sure what's happening with um, the media here. Just bear with me this morning. I know I'm taking a little bit of time. Praise God. It says, for the vision, verse 3, is set for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely, there is an assurance that if you wait for it, it will surely come, it will not tarry. For the vision is for an appointed time, the vision will speak at the end. So the vision sets you in motion. Praise God. It may not be speaking now, but it will surely come to pass. And when it comes to pass, it will speak. Amen. So listen. You may find that on this journey, and indeed you will find disappointments will happen. Some things that look like setbacks, like delays, would happen. 
But this scripture is telling you that even when it looks like it is taking time or it is tarrying, you see, it is actually not tarrying. You know, he said, though it tarry, it will not tarry. In other words, everything that is happening is part of the journey. Are you following? And you are actually moving forward. So when disappointments happen and they look like drawbacks, understand that you are actually taking steps forward. It's a mentality you must incorporate as a visionaire because there will be things that will happen that look like they are going to break you. There will be disappointments along the way, but it's part of the journey. In the natural, it doesn't look like you are moving forward, but you are moving forward. Hallelujah. You must understand when the Bible says that all things are working together for your good. So even when it happens and it looks like it's not working for you, it is actually working for you. Praise God. The drawbacks are working for you. It's moving you forward. Hallelujah. Expect disappointments. If Jesus could have a Judas, expect that there will be Judas. He said, you are not greater than your master. So why are you complaining when a Judas happens? Praise God. Someone goes and sells you out, sells out your secret, steals your code. <laughs> Hallelujah. Goes to say something unkind to you and you didn't know that that was what was blocking you on your journey or from finding favor. They've gone to lock the door behind you. Praise God. You must understand the strategy of, you know, enacting the tabernacle of David in disappointments. You must, you must understand the strategy of posting some dance moves when things look like they are not happening for you. Are you following? Praise God. Like the choir sang this morning, it's all working for your good. Everything is working out for your good. Praise God. Let's rise on our feet this morning. Time is fast spent.